Well, good morning again. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 is where we'll turn our attention for this morning. And we'll begin talking about the next test of faith that James wants to give to believers, wants to give to us. Uh, even in 2021, something very practical for us to know uh, as believers, whether we are a Christian or not, whether we're truly saved or not. And it is our goal, as we work through this book, to really set our pride aside, to uh, really act in humility to say, it is a matter of first importance to know whether I am truly saved. Maybe I've uh, had a misconception or misperception of what it mean, meant to be a Christian, and now through the going through the study of the book of James, I realize that I am indeed not a Christian, and I hope that it is our prayer that will whatever is on our hearts and mind, whatever the Lord is dealing with us about, that we will put things to the side and want to get things right with the Lord. So this, this morning we will begin looking at this next test, the test of the tongue. How to control the tongue. How are we to tame the tongue? And as we get started, let's bow in a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Dear Lord, as we open up the word now, we come to the word hungry for what it has to teach us and what it has to say to us and how it is going to transform our lives. And so, Lord, we invite you to do that this morning. We ask that you would do that this morning and help us to respond as a result of what you have to say to us in an obedient fashion, an obedient way. So, Lord, we invite you to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you know by now, James is concerned with finding out whether you are who you say you are, whether I am who I say I am. If I say that I'm a believer, well, let me see the evidence of that. Let me see the fruit of that. Um, help us to know, help us out in, in knowing whether or not that you're saved. What evidence do you have? Just like an apple tree is not truly an apple tree until it bears the fruit, until it puts the fruit on the branches, and then we can come to the conclusion to say, well, that is indeed an apple tree. James says, in order for us to really know that you're saved, you're going to show it by your actions, by the things you do. James warns us in James chapter 1, verse 22, uh, 22 but don't be hearers of the word only. You're only deceiving yourself if you're only a hearer and not a doer. So the assumption here is that if one is saved, we will be doing things in accordance to God's will and not contrary to it. And that just is, is, is uh, natural. That's the lo uh, logical conclusion that we would come to. True believers are active participants for the cause of Christ. We're not simply bystanders that go against the, the word of God. We don't claim to be followers and hearers without doing something. James calls these people simply hearers. We don't want to be simply hearers. Those who are in earshot but aren't doers. So as we come to chapter 3 then, James gives us another test. The test of the tongue. And this is and I mean this as, as a pun intended here, but this is one of the most telling things, uh, our test that James gives here. He will say to his audience in the original time, and he will say to us in 2021, your speech reveals the condition of your heart. James says your speech, the things you say, will reveal or it does reveal the condition of your heart. And nothing is more telling on the heart than our tongue. And there is another pun. It's meant to be that way. Nothing is more telling on the heart than the tongue. So James mentions the tongue. And if you have already read, and perhaps several of you have told me that you've read through the book of James several times now. And that's great. I commend you for doing that. But you will have noticed that James mentions the tongue in at least every chapter of his book. In chapter 1, verses 19 and 26, he talks about the tongue. In chapter 2, verse 12, and then in chapter 3, for the majority of chapter 3, he's talking about the tongue. Then when you come to chapter 4, verse 11, and chapter 5, verse 12. Now remember that James says here that a Christian ought to have a difference in their lives. There ought to be something different about the way a Christian lives, about the way a Christian looks, about what the Christian does throughout their lives. The, the difference shows up in a Christian's life 
in the way that we go through trials, the way we endure through trials. We've already talked about that. We've already seen the difference in the way we have humility during the temptations of our lives. We've already seen the difference in how we should have a loving concern for the needy without showing partiality. And we've already seen that there should be a pattern of doing good works in our lives as a result of being a Christ follower. And now James will tell us as we approach chapter 3 that this new life that we call salvation or we call redemption that will be evident by the way we talk, by the things that we say, the things that come out of our mouth. And so James is demanding here that we recognize that this living faith, remember it's not a dead faith that we have, it's a living faith, it will show itself in how we control the tongue and how we tame the tongue. Now when James blames the tongue here for sin and for sins committed, he's using something that was common in the Hebraic expression. And what he says here is that the tongue is a member of the body. And so he's going to personify this member of the body as he goes through the text. It's kind of like this. When in uh, Middle Easterners, when someone would get caught stealing, many of you know that a thief would get their hand cut off or a, a member of their uh, fingers cut off. Well, that's not really getting to the point, is it? It's only symbolic to say, well, since you stole something, we're going to cut off your hand or we're going to cut off your finger, right? It's to remind them that, and to show by way of identification that they're a thief. But really, the, where do they really need to get to and what do they really need to cut if they're going to try to teach that person a lesson? It's the heart. It's the matter of the heart. See, so James personifies the tongue to say it's this person or it's this thing that needs help. It's this member of the body. So he uses the tongue interchangeably throughout chapter 3 with the mouth and says that the tongue lives as a representation of what is going on in the heart. Your tongue is a representation of your inner self. What you speak reveals what you believe in the heart. In the Old Testament, the rabbis used to say that the tongue was like an arrow. In Psalm 64, verse 3, it says, The evildoers are those who aim bitter words like arrows. Now, why doesn't it say knife there? Because you have to be in close proximity to use a knife to hurt somebody. But it says arrows because you can shoot an arrow across the field and wound and hurt somebody. So our words are like arrows that you can shoot across the room at somebody. You can shoot across the county at somebody. You can, you can you do that by way of letter. You can buy, do that by way of a phone call. And you can do that by way of social media these days or by email. You can wound or hurt somebody on the opposite side of the United States of America or the world for that matter by your tongue. What a picture. We have the ability to hurt people by the things we say. In other words, what is in our mouth is a weapon. Somebody said that we all have a concealed weapon. I thought about you know how popular um, concealed weapons permits got a couple of years ago. Everybody was kind of going out and getting their concealed weapons permit, their CWP license. You know, everybody was it was going for that. Well, really, what benoes to everybody is that you all have a concealed weapon until you open your mouth, and then it's not concealed anymore, is it? And we all have the ability to hurt somebody and, and really uh, devastate somebody when we open up our mouths. Over the years, numerous studies have been done about how many words have been spoken between, um, uh, of humans. And they've categorized this between males and females. And we talked about this um, back in chapter 1, and I don't want to spend a lot of time here. But suffice it to say that on average, men speak about 7,000 words a day. On average, women speak about 20,000 words per day. Now, it, it bears repeating these facts again, and I'm going to refrain from making too many comments here because I want to stay in your good graces. But just note, ladies, that when your man gets home from work, he's used up all of his words for the day, right? And you have quite a few to go. So that's where we're going to leave that. So have a little grace there. 
This means that one-fifth of our lives are spent talking. Can you believe that? You write many volumes of books in your lifetime just by talking. And it is, it is very interesting me, to me, have you ever thought about this? That when you go to the doctor, especially as a younger child, what is the, one of the first things they do? They take out that funny-looking popsicle stick, and they say what? Stick out your And they depress your tongue, and it, your mouth will reveal what's going on in your life. James says the same thing is true spiritually. The way you talk, the way I talk, the way we talk, the things that are coming out of our mouth reveal the heart. They reveal what's going on in our lives spiritually. So let's see what your tongue is revealing about your heart. Controlling the tongue then is essential. And James gives us five compelling reasons why we ought to control the tongue. Five compelling reasons why we ought to try to tame our tongue. Number one, and we're going to look at two of these today and the, and the rest we'll pick up later. Number one reason that we should control the tongue is because it has such great potential to condemn. The, the potential to condemn us is so very great. Now you'll see this in verses one and two. Verse one says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will become or will be judged with a greater strictness. I used to hear my dad say something like this. If you want to know what kind of uh, person that person he or she is, just wait a while. Just listen to the things that are coming out of their mouth, and you'll know exactly who they are, what they stand for, what they're for, or what they're against. Just listen to who they say they are. And the more a person has that opportunity to talk, the more they reveal about themselves the more they say who they really are on the inside. So this is what the mindset I believe James has when he comes to verse 1, when he says, don't be one who thrusts themselves into a teaching position. Don't be somebody who puts themselves out front in a preaching position. Why? Because there is going to be a stricter judgment. And I believe what James is saying here is it's teachers and preachers who use their tongue or use their mouth to speak. You'll say, well, that's um, uh, wonderful, Willie. I'm glad you came to that um, uh, point in your life that you realize that. Well, what James is saying here is the more you have an opportunity to talk, the more you have the opportunity to mess up in life. The more you have the opportunity to say something that doesn't line up with God's word. And that's really the point here. James is saying, if you're going to talk on behalf of God, if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to be a teacher, <clears throat> pardon me, you're speaking on behalf of God. And it must be right. It must be according to the scriptures and not contrary to it. So James starts with this group of preachers and teachers and says that the proper speech is marked by a true faith that also applies that to the preaching of the gospel. You must speak accurately about God and about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the Holy Spirit when you teach and preach. And the more you have the opportunity to do that, the more opportunity there is to fail. And so don't rush into wanting to speak because the potential to condemn is so great. And even those who teach need to take a personal inventory. Am I speaking accurately on behalf of God? And trust me, this is something that I do, if not on a weekly basis, up on a daily basis. If I make this statement, is that statement backed up and based on the authority of the Word of God? I don't come in here all willy-nilly and saying, well, I hope this will fly. I just hope this is going to work. I had somebody ask me not too long ago, do you ever just kind of, you know, do a just kind of go in on a Sunday morning and just kind of wherever it opens up, just kind of, you know, the old flop and drop method. I said, you, you have just described to me my worst nightmare because I'm not up here speaking on behalf of Willie Walters. I'm up here speaking on the, based on the authority of the Word of God. How could I treat it anything less than that? We are to give our time to it. We are to give serious dedication to it. And I would never 
come up here in my wildest imagination having not prepared the week or a couple of weeks before that. I don't, we, that's not how we operate and that's not how we should operate. So the teacher, the preacher needs to take a personal inventory to see if their speech is the real deal. Now, in the background of, the, of, of this assembly, of what James is talking about, or the crowd that he, to he is talking to here, he's writing to some people where they were, they were failing to consider that they could mess up in their speech if given the opportunity to talk. And so many of them were standing up in the congregation and talking and, and, and coming to, uh, into the synagogue and just kind of talking about different things and giving their, their thoughts on things. They were aspiring to ascend to a teaching role without giving the thoughts of the implications of it. There was no implication or thought to it or little that was going on. So James says these are, these are the teachers that are coming up before you. So when he uses the word teacher... In James's day, these teachers were, the word is translated masters here. The, the priests who would get up in the synagogues, the masters, the rabbis of the Jewish faith here. And, and, they, and when we look back to the New Testament, they really don't have such a good reputation, do they? In fact, it's this crowd that Jesus comes and really chews them up and spits them out. He overturns the table and the money changers there in the temple. But these were men who loved this position. They loved their title. They loved their honor. They loved the recognition that they got from being a teacher or a preacher or a rabbi. They loved their power. They loved their prestige. And in fact, everywhere a rabbi went, uh, they were treated with great respect. In fact, it was forbidden for a rabbi to take any money uh, for the speaking that they did. In fact, that they were to go out and raise their own funds But culturally, what happened was they would forgo that and they would rely on the the command to treat a rabbi with respect to say, well, the, the scriptures say that you're supposed to respect me. The scriptures say that you're supposed to provide things for me, so I'm not going to work anymore, and what I'm going to do is is fall on uh, your grace is that you're going to do what's right. And so they, they would profane the name of God, and they profane what God had commanded them. And so the rabbis went around getting wealthy at other people's expenses and totally turned the thing upside down how it was supposed to be. So... It was the proper thing to do in society to provide for them and provide lots of cares. And the rabbis become people who leached uh, themselves and latched themselves to public to the uh, to the public, and they became self seekers. So it's not how it was intended to be, but th- this is the crowd that was in the official uh, role as rabbi of the day. So that's the official teachers. But then there were also some people who were unofficial teachers, people who could get up and kind of talk as uh, they would go along in the synagogue. And this is where we see Jesus coming to do that. He got up and read from the scriptures and then sat down and talked to them about that. That was the environment in which he could do that. According to the rabbis, Jesus, now you remember this, Jesus was untrained, right? He didn't go to any rabbinical school or any kind of teaching school. He was just the son of a Jewish carpenter, not qualified to stand up and talk in a synagogue. Pretty ironic, isn't it? But this is not so foreign to us. In the church today, we have preachers, we have teachers, we have evangelists who come around, we have guest speakers, uh, we have uh, uh, pastor teachers, we have Sunday school teachers, we have children's classes, uh, and sometimes on... uh, uh, Wednesday night or a Sunday night, we might get someone, one of you, to, uh, to fill in for me if I can't be here or if I'm sick or something like that. So that's not uncommon for there to be an official teacher and then there to be an unofficial teacher. But in spite of all of this, James gives this warning because so many people were doing harm to the name and the nature of Christ by aspiring to do this not taking into consideration the harm that they could do if they were not prepared to speak on account of Christ. So, 1 Timothy 1.6 says this, Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions. They're swerving away from the, the, from the, the, precise, the precision of which they're to deliver the good news about, and they're desiring to be false teachers of the law, or to be, desiring to be 
teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. In other words, they're getting up there, making vain sayings. They're telling stories about what's going on in their lives. They're talking about things that don't, have, uh, that don't make a hill of beans when it comes to the gospel. And, and they're just telling fanciful stories and so on. And James is not restraining those who are called and those who are gifted by any means. He's saying if you're called by, by God to be a preacher or teacher, by all means, that's what you ought to do. But he is saying... To everybody else, take this position seriously. And don't go around shooting off your mouth ever how you want to do and giving any kind of talk about whatever you want to talk about. The Bible is our roadmap, and it's, it's promote Christ and Christ alone, not us and not our, not our standing. So it's a very weighter, weighty matter to stand before a group of people and to speak on behalf of God. The truths of the Bible, James says. And we don't want to be unprepared, and we don't want to be unqualified. That's going to get people into a stricter judgment. The responsibility of the teacher is given twice in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 3, uh, verses 17 and 18, and chapter 33, verses 7, 8, and 9. The responsibilities of the teacher, where the teacher is really warned, then he's sort of a watchman uh, on the wall to warn people, and he better be careful that he does a good job. He better be careful that he does it the right way. Or their blood is liable to be on his hands. In other words, there's a sense in which there is great responsibility to be a teacher or a preacher. One commentator said this. Don't swell the ranks of a preacher. Don't promote that as, as if this is the place where you should strive to get to. In fact, we were learning in school that if you can do anything else other than be a preacher or a teacher, you ought to go do that. Because there are several reasons for that. In other words, what they're saying, what they warned us about is, if you're not 100% sure that you are called to this, then you need to go find something else to do. But there's also a warning to say, if, you, if, you're, there is, if there's something else in your life that you feel like God has called you to do, go do that. Don't, don't try to put this job of being a preacher or a teacher up on some kind of pedestal. Don't swell the ranks of the teacher or the preacher. Why? Because your tongue has so much power to condemn, and who is it going to condemn? It's going to condemn you, preacher or teacher, by the things you say and the things that you do. Now, notice also that James includes himself. And I think this shows a lot of humility in, in the fact that he says, we, we are the preachers and teachers. He, he includes himself in this warning. It shows humility. And he says, we are going to be shown a stricter judgment for those who teach. If the preacher and teacher across this land, across this country, understood that we are being held accountable to God for what we say, to his people, to his sheep, to the congregation, then I think our sermons would be better. And, and by better, I mean more truthful. Not necessarily uh, fanciful. I think that they'll have more potential to convict than to, put, to, than to pat somebody on the back. I was riding through Hendersonville the other night. I was coming home on Crab Creek Road and past the Universalist Unitarian Church. And Melissa was behind me, and I didn't know if she saw, and I asked her later if she saw what was on the sign. What was on the sign was the, the sermon for Sunday morning. And it said this, Animal Heaven. Come hear about Animal Heaven. Now, folks, that is, that is, a, that is a dire warning that we're going in the wrong direction. That a church is going to stand up and preach or teach about where animals go and to call that some kind of heaven. Now, having said that, it is a small thing what you and I think when it comes about how we are doing for the Lord, for the Word of God. It is largely important what God thinks what we are saying about Him. What He says is most convicting. So being a teacher or a preacher of God's Word is a very dangerous occupation for anyone. Because of the power of the tongue to speak error, to speak misjudgment, or to speak inappropriately, or to misrepresent Christ 
or the Holy Spirit. And I take that very, very seriously. Now, notice verse 2, what verse 2 says. He's already addressed the preachers and teachers, but there's another crowd here. For we all stumble in many ways. So he gets past the preachers and teachers and says, not everybody should be aspiring to be a preacher and teacher. Why, James? Because we all stumble. And we all stumble in this area in our speech. This word stumble means to sin or to pass transgression. But is there anybody that gets a pass on this, James? No, he says. Not at all. We've all stumbled in our speech. We will all stumble in the future in our speech. In, in, in case you weren't in the first group of preachers and teachers, James goes all-inclusive when he says, we all. Nobody gets a pass on this. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9 says, Who can say, I have cleansed my heart and I am pure from sin? And the answer to that is nobody. Nobody but the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of all the ways we stumble, out of all the ways we fall short, the most dominant way is with our tongue. It's with our speech. It's by the things that we say. And it has great power to condemn us. And you may be here today and you say, I don't know what you mean when you're, say, sinning by your tongue or your speech. Let me say, first of all, you'd probably be in the minority, but let me just give you a little bit about uh, what the Bible refers to directly or indirectly as it refers to sins of the tongue. Listen to a few of these. The Bible refers directly or indirectly to a wicked tongue, a deceitful tongue, a lying tongue, a perverse tongue, a filthy tongue, a corrupt tongue, a bitter tongue, an angry tongue, a crafty tongue, a flattering tongue, a slanderous tongue, a gossiping tongue, a backbiting tongue, a blaspheming tongue, a foolish tongue, a boasting tongue, a murmuring tongue, a complaining tongue, a cursing tongue, a contentious tongue, a sensual tongue, a vile tongue, a tail-bearing tongue, a whispering tongue, an exaggerating tongue. Did you or I see ourselves anywhere in that list? So James says here, control your tongue. No wonder God put, one commentator said this, no wonder God put your tongue in a cage behind your teeth, walled in your mouth. I believe God has put within us a new heart, and with that heart comes a new tongue, a new way to talk, putting off the old and on with the new. But even that new tongue becomes victim to our fallenness, doesn't it? So James says, control your tongue because it has so much power to condemn us. Point number two, and we'll see this in verse two, in the latter half of verse two, it has the power to control. Not only does it have the power to condemn us, but it has the power con to, to control us. And if anyone, verse two, does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. And what James says here, in a very general sense, if a man does not continue to stumble with his mouth or words, then he is a mature person. That is, he has reached spiritual maturity. I don't think he means that he's perfect in every way. But he's reached some sense of spiritual maturity. He's gone from an infant in Christ to a spiritual um, uh, man or woman in Christ. But how, how do you know that? What is the evidence of that? Because they used to talk in vain ways. They used to talk in vile ways. And that whole long list of things was the way in which they used to talk. But now, they don't talk like that. Why? Because there's been a change of heart. And within this new heart, in this, in this uh, uh, trying to become more like Christ, in that desire to become more like Christ, we don't talk like we used to. We don't entertain the things we used to. Do you remember what uh, they said of Jesus in John chapter 7, verse 45? The officers then came to the chief priest and the Pharisees and said to them, they said to them, why do you not bring him to us? Why, why, you were to go out and get him. Why didn't you bring him to, to us? And they said this, no one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like this man. Well, who was this man, Jesus? The Bible says, one who did not sin, neither was there deceit found where? In his mouth. No sin in his life, 
and no sin in his mouth. So we are to be like Christ with no sin in our life and no sin in our speech. Now notice this next phrase in verse 2. This is really fascinating. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Now follow this. If a person can learn to control the greater, the lesser will be easy to control. Say, so what do you mean by that? It's like this. If you were to go out here to the truck stop on I-26, and you were to get one of the tractor-trailer drivers who have over the road, they're, they're from here to California and everywhere in between, and you were to say, sir, would you be able to come out here and back this lawnmower off of my trailer for me? Well, yeah, they could do that. They drive a tractor trailer, a 53-foot tractor trailer across the country. They can drive a lawnmower. You see, the, the ability to be able to manhandle the grader gives them the automatic right almost to be able to control a lawnmower. James says the same exact thing is true with our bodies. If you can control the greater mouth, the rest of the body will be easy to control. If you can control the greater, the lesser will follow through. Isn't that practical? And James is a very practical book. It just gets right down to this. Focus on your mouth. And if the Holy Spirit gets a control of the most vital part of your body, the most potent member, the rest of the body will be subdued to that. That's as practical as it gets. Psalm 39.1, I believe the psalmist understood this. I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. In closing, James gives two illustrations here. These are very, very good examples. Sometimes we search around for examples to use, but James gives wonderful examples here, really good illustrations here. In verse 3, if we put bits into the, into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. By controlling the horse's tongue, by putting that, that bridle in his mouth, that bit in his mouth, in, in the reins up over the mane, you can give a little bit of a tug one way, and it can go a certain direction. You can give a little bit of a tug another way, and it will go another direction. Did you know that, up to my, my recollection, that no horse has ever volunteered to do anything for a man? I've not interviewed all the horses, but that's the way I see it. No horse has been running free and wild in the open and say, you know what I want to do? I just would love to go attach myself to that plow, be beat beaten with a whip, and plow that field for eight hours a day. That's just what I'd like to do today. No, no horse has ever went up to a person and said, Sir, like Mr. Ed, you remember Mr. Ed, what I want you to do, Wilbur, is I want you to put a bit in my mouth, control me, make me obey you, go where you say I need to go. I want to eat the food that you say I need to eat. In fact, I want you to get on my back and ride me like the Pony Express used to ride horses where they're sweating at almost to the point of death. No horse has volunteered for that. What has happened? Man has trained them. Man has put a bit in their mouth. Man has put a bridle on them. In fact, I would go to as far as to say that a horse is actually completely useless unless we train them, unless we do that. That's precisely what James is saying. We as believers of the body are completely useless unless we can learn to control and tame our tongues. We cannot proclaim the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ and do good for the body of Christ if we're out using our tongue to, to, to tear down people and to tear down the church and to cause disunity. So, how do you control a horse? It's the same way you control the mouth or the body. You put a bit, something small, into the horse's mouth and break that horse down until he is taught to obey those commands. And we, as human beings and as believers, are to feast on God's word. And it becomes our steering wheel to say, go here, do this, don't do these things. Why? To give glory and honor to God. We don't do it for ourselves for vain reasons, but we do it for him. 
Now, the second illustration James gives is just as powerful as the first. In fact, as you think about, think of the size of a horse compared to the, to the little bit. And then the next part, he says, this is the second illustration on how to steer a ship, verse 4. Look at the ships also. Though they are also so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. You say, well, some of the ships in James's day weren't very big. They were small ships. They were small little boats, fishing boats. Well, I beg to differ. In Acts chapter 27, when Paul is there and they've come across a, a, a bad way, and, the, ship, and the, the, the waters and the waves are getting out of hand, Paul says that there's 276 passengers on board that ship. That's quite a few people. So those ships were even large. And when that ship began to get out of control, and those winds were driving it where it didn't need to go, the pilot or the captain would steer that little part on the bottom side of those ships called a rudder. And it would steer it to safety. Nowadays, perhaps some of you have been on a cruise. Those cruise ships are 70,000 pounds. They can hold thousands and thousands of people. You can have all the food in the world that you want to eat night and day around the clock. There's people everywhere, ice sculpture, luggage, all the things, all the amenities. It's really a floating city to have that many people. But if you were to go into the captain's quarters or you were to go up on the bridge you would see a little mechanism about that big. Perhaps some of you have seen it on TV, watching TV shows or different things. The pilot is sitting in a captain's chair, and he's controlling the whole thing with a little joystick that controls the rudder at the back of that ship. And he can dock that ship and port that ship and have complete control over that ship and never touch the dock at least once. If you, cannot, if you and I can get control of the little tongue, the little member of our body, it can move and dominate and subdue everything else. The, the idea, James says, is this. Listen. Power applied to the right point or at the right point is sufficient to control the whole vessel. Power applied at the right point is sufficient to control the whole vessel. And power applied at the right point being our mouths is sufficient to control the whole person. The power of the tongue is great. It has the power con to control. It has the power to condemn us. But we can control it if we will get busy subjecting ourselves to the Word of God, submitting ourselves to the Word of God. But how can we practically control the tongue? How, what are ways that in which we can do this? Let me suggest a few. Speak only gracious words. Speak only kind words. Speak only loving words. Edifying words. Sensitive words. Thoughtful words. And I say this in a tone because I know it's hard to do. What Satan wants us to do is to mess up with our speech so that we don't have any other grounds to proclaim the name of Christ. And man, is it easy to do. When someone cuts us off in traffic, when someone spills a gallon of milk or breaks our favorite bowl or puts a scratch on our favorite car, we don't really want to say the gracious words, do we? We don't want to say the edifying words, the loving words, the comforting words, the gentle words, the words of blessing, the words of humility. We want to fire off and shoot off our mouth, don't we? Folks, if we can learn to control our tongue, it will go a long way with our spouses. It will go a long, long way with our children. It will go a long way with our neighbors. It will go a long way with our friends. It will go a long way with our church family. The tongue is a powerful instrument. What we know about the tongue and what we've already mentioned is that it can tear down. It can dare tear down people. Perhaps you have been the recipient of somebody that has tried to tear you down 
by their speech that is really revealing their heart. But people make up churches, and it can tear down churches. It can, it can tear down and destroy relationships. It can wreck marriages, and it can devastate families. It can rip up a nation, and we're seeing that today. It can lead to murder. It can lead to war. But on the other hand, if we can subdue our speech, if we can subdue our tongue, it can build up. It can create love. It can create enthusiasm. It can create encouragement. It can bring such comfort to people. It can bring such joy. And it can bring such peace to people. The tongue is a power, powerful thing. If we can learn to get a hold of our tongue, the way we respond, the way we speak, it can get a hold of our whole lives. So I believe that is why James commits a whole chapter to talking about the tongue. Look at your speech, James says. Is your speech the speech of a living faith? Or is your speech the speech of a dead faith? And apply ourselves to controlling our tongue because it has the power to condemn us and it has the power to control us. James is so practical for us. He puts it right down on our level. He gets it right where we need to be. Where he gets it right where it needs to be for us to understand. I hope that this week, that as we think about our speech, not just maybe the vain things we might say, but how we interact with each other will be at the forefront of our minds. We're going to be in here for VBS. There's going to be kids everywhere, Lord willing. And how awful would it be for a kid to come in here and hear us tear them down or to break their spirit or say, you spilled that drink and condemn them over something like that or say, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We'll clean it up. You see, that kind, of, that kind of answer has the power to set a person on a trajectory to know Christ or to possibly not know Christ just by the things that we say. It is such a powerful tongue. So let's work on that. Let's commit to working on that this week. Will you pray with or stand with me as we pray?